Well, good morning and welcome to another teaching. It is a Thursday morning here in Texas and it's a it's a good morning to be spending time with Jesus, to be loving on Jesus, to be growing to know him, to be growing to obey him, um, and above all, to be growing to please him. It, it ought to be our heart's desire to be more and more pleasing to our Heavenly Father, to Jesus Christ, our Lord, and to the Holy Spirit. We do that by growing in our relationship with each member of the triune God, and we do that by, by, by growing to obey them. Right. Um, so thank you, Lord Jesus. OK, so new book. We went we did first Timothy and now we're moving into second Timothy. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Good book four chapters. I don't know how many teachings it'll be, but it's uh, man, it's just good stuff. Uh, first Timothy was a good book as I I always come away when we finish a book, just believing I left too much on the table. So uh, but that's why we get to go back into it more and more time in the word of God, more and more time in the scriptures. The meaning of life is growing to know the Son of God, Jesus, and growing to feed our spirit and soul in the Word of God. So, Father, we thank you for your mercy, your favor, your goodness, and your grace on our lives. Father, we thank you for this, this book of 2 Timothy, Father. We thank you for this letter written by the Apostle Paul near the very end of his life, Father. We thank you, Lord, for just the tremendous insights in this letter. We thank you for the love in this letter, Father. Father, above all, we thank you for Jesus, our only Lord and Savior and Master and King. Lord Jesus, we thank you for becoming a human man for us. We thank you for living a perfect, righteous life on our behalf that we could never live. We thank you for dying a torturous death on our behalf that we deserve to die. And we thank you that you're alive and risen and we worship you today, our risen Savior. Holy Spirit, we ask you to lead us and guide us now as we open your word and we begin this new book of 2 Timothy. We do ask that you would give us eyes that see, ears to hear, and hearts that would truly understand. In Jesus' name and for Jesus' sake, amen and amen. Okay, 2 Timothy. Paul is in, uh, is in prison. Um, he's going to make that clear in the letter. It's his second imprisonment, and scholars tell us he won't get out. Um, he is, he is going to, to be executed at the hands, his, uh, history tells us, historians tell us by, a, uh, by, by Nero and, um, and he's going to go home to be with Jesus. And so the, uh, the letter is a, is a powerful, powerful, emotional letter. It's a, it's a man of God, perhaps the greatest man of God to ever live, right? Jesus was God is God. When he walked the earth, he was the God man, right? Um, and, you know, this man, uh, the Apostle Paul, wrote half the New Testament. He wrote 13 of the 27 books of the New Testament. And he wrote, you know, several of those from prison. Um, and this one is being written or dictated why he's chained uh, in a dark prison cell. So, Wow. Mm. Verses 1 and 2, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, according to the promise of life that is in Christ Jesus. Verse 2, to Timothy, my dear son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father in Christ Jesus our Lord. It's interesting in many letters, you know, if you turn to just certain letters, if you, if you turn to say, where am I here? I'm looking at the the book of Romans, and Paul opens the book of Romans saying, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, right? Um, here, this opens Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ. So again, he uses his title. It's one of tremendous authority. Um, and again, he is writing this to a, a spiritual son that, that he, that is a true spiritual son in Timothy that he, that he loves with all his heart. I said this before, as, as men and women, we ought to have spiritual fathers and mothers that uh, that we love that we admire and that we submit to and and that's because you know we we know their their love and concern and desire for us it's been proven week after week month after month year after year decade after decade it's been proven their concern for us their desire for us to grow in Christ 
they've proven that they have no motivation except for us to, to walk with Jesus more deeply and more intimately. Spiritual fathers and mothers are extremely important, but, but spiritual authority always flows along the lines of relationship. It doesn't flow along the lines of, of position or title. OK, just because I'm a pastor, that that in itself is not spiritual authority. Just because someone is a deacon or a ministry leader or a life group leader or an elder um, or a bishop, um, the, the title itself is not spiritual authority. Spiritual authority is given. It's not taken. Um, and again, it's it's. It really is an authority that's grounded in a, in a genuine love and desire and concern to see others grow in their relationship with Jesus Christ. A, a genuine spiritual authority has no motivation except to see uh, their sons and daughters truly growing to know Jesus and live for Jesus more and more and more and more. Um and so obviously our greatest example of what spiritual authority would look like is Jesus, okay, when he walked the, the earth for 33 and a half years, when you see him in the Gospels, when you see how he lived, how he spoke, how he managed himself, um, you see the, the perfect picture of everything. And of course, the, 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 a picture of spiritual authority. And certainly we see it here. Um, we see it in the Apostle Paul for this for this man, Timothy. So again, I would ask you, you know, who are the spiritual mothers and spiritual fathers in your life? Who are the men and women who have an earnest desire to see you grow in your relationship with Jesus Christ, our Lord? Uh, these may be men or women in the church. They may be outside the church, but these are mature men and women of God who, who want to see you grow in Christ, who want to see you flourish in your walk with Jesus Christ, and they have no agenda for you except to see you walk with Jesus more deeply, more intimately, and more obediently. Who are you a spiritual father or mother to? Who, who do you have as a genuine concern in your heart for your brothers and sisters in Christ that are that are not as far along as you are in the faith. It certainly stands to reason that, you know, um, you know, when we learn to be a, a, a spiritual son or daughter, we'll, we'll be a better spiritual father or mother. But these things, you know, can and, and should coexist, right? We always, all, we always ought to be looking to, to sow into the lives of others and build up others and disciple others. And at the same time, always be, be willing to learn, um, and, you know, be teachable to, uh, to the spiritual fathers and mothers the Lord has put in our lives. So here we have Paul. Again, he uses the title Apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. So again, he's an apostle, but it's not by his own will. Okay. Um, in Ephesians 4, you know, uh, you know Jesus gives us... Uh, uh, you know, Paul writes in there that Jesus gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets... Some to be pastors, some to be teachers, and some to be evangelists, okay, um, to equip the body of Christ. These are ministry callings. Now, again, every single Christian, every single true, genuine Christian is called to be in ministry, okay? Um, uh, not every Christian is called to do it as a full-time job or to be, to, to, that's, that's the way that they earn their living, OK, but every Christian is called to, to minister to others. And we've all been given gifts to do that very thing, to build up the body of Christ and to minister to the body of Christ. But you notice he says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, um, all of us are called into ministry. Every Christian is called into ministry. But obviously, the vast majority of Christians are not called into ministry full-time ministry, which is to say, this is where you make your living. This is your full-time job. If you are called into full-time ministry, if the Lord has called you uh, to be a, a, a full-time pastor and you're getting paid for that, there ought to be a material evidence in your life of your walk in devotion with Jesus, of your sincere desire and giftedness to build up and disciple others 
uh, in Jesus Christ our Lord. There ought to be a zeal for Christ, a zeal for his word, a devotion to him. Again, that ought to be evident in someone that has a full-time pastoral ministry office, right? And makes their living doing that. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, according to the promise of life that is in Christ Jesus. There is a promise of life. He's an apostle, and and anything else we are really comes under the purview of 2 Timothy 1, verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, according to the promise of life that is in Christ Jesus. Everything in our lives is according to, to the promise of life that is in Christ Jesus, okay? Um, The the Bible, the word of God, the scriptures gives us one promise of life, of eternal life, of everlasting life, and that is only in Christ Jesus. That is only according to the promise of life that is in Christ Jesus. If someone is not in Christ Jesus today, if you're not firmly clinging to Jesus alone, trusting and relying on Jesus alone for the forgiveness of your sins, the salvation of your soul, deliverance from the wrath of God the Father, and deliverance from eternal hell, and to bring you to heaven when you die, if you're not trusting in Jesus alone for those things, then you have no life. You have no spiritual life. Unfortunately, you remain in spiritual death. And if you leave this life, if you die in that state, only an eternity in hell awaits. This is why we do these things. This is why we humbly plead with you to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. John 1.12 says, yet to all who received him, Jesus To those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Okay? You can receive Jesus right now. If you're not sure, you can simply humble yourself before the Lord and and simply call out to him. It's not our words that save us, right? Romans 10, 13 says that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved, right? We do use our words to communicate our heart to the Lord, right? But you can simply humble yourself before him and call out call out to him and just simply proclaim, Lord Jesus, I I confess I am a, a sinful man or a sinful woman. I am a sinful person. And Lord Jesus, I know I cannot save myself. I am a hopeless, desperate, helpless sinner. And I believe, Lord Jesus, that without you, only an eternity in hell awaits. But Jesus, I do believe you are the Son of God. I do believe you did come into this world even for me. And I believe you lived a perfect, righteous life. Even for me, Lord Jesus. Lord Jesus, I believe you died a perfect, righteous, torturous death on the cross on my behalf and in my place. And Lord Jesus, I believe you are alive and risen today. Therefore, I do ask you now, Lord Jesus, to come into my heart, to be the Lord of my life, to save me from my sin and to bring me to heaven when I die. Lord Jesus, I place all my faith and trust and confidence in you alone to save me and to be my everlasting Lord and God. Heavenly Father, it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. So again, I want to say again, it's it's not just puppeting words. Our words don't save us. It's Christ that saves us. But you can use the words I just used there. Follow along, use the words. It's the genuineness of and sincerity of our heart that matters. If you pray to receive Christ and you believe he is the son of God, God the son, and that he did come into this world and live for you and die for you and rise from the dead, and you're trusting in him, you will be saved. God has given his word. Mm. Everything is according to the promise of life that is in Christ Jesus. Without Jesus, we have no life at all. We have no promise. We have no life. We have no purpose. We have no meaning. We have no nothing. Hmm. Verse 2, to Timothy, my dear son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father in Christ Jesus our Lord. It's interesting. He only adds this word mercy here 
um, grace, mercy, and peace in his pastoral letters. He always says grace and peace, but to the, the ministers, he adds this word, mercy. Charles Spurgeon believed it was intentional by the Holy Spirit, believing that is as full-time ministers, those who whose work and living come from teaching the word of God and advancing the cause of the gospel of God and the kingdom of God, that boy, do we need mercy. I've said this before. I want grace. I want peace. I want love. I want all the incredible characteristics and virtues of my heavenly father. I want them all. But if I had to choose one, I believe I'd choose mercy if I could only have one. I'm a man who needs mercy. I believe above all, I need mercy. Have mercy on me, Lord, a sinner. Remember, mercy is when we do not get the punishment from God that we do deserve. Grace is when we get blessings from God that we do not deserve. Mercy is when we do not get the punishment from God that we do deserve, right? He says to Timothy, my dear son, he's not his natural son. Uh, Paul is his spiritual father and, and he loves him unconditionally with the love of Christ. Grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father in Christ Jesus our Lord. It's interesting, you know, most often we're, it's the material blessings that, that we're most focused on, right? But if you, could, if you had to have, if you could only get certain blessings from your Heavenly Father, would you want the material blessings or would you want the spiritual blessings of grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Jesus Christ our Lord? I'll say again, when Paul says from God, the father and Jesus Christ, our Lord, if Jesus wasn't God, this would be an absurd statement. You would never put God, the father, and then you would end it there if, if, if Jesus wasn't God. Okay. So when he says grace, mercy, and peace from God, the father and Christ Jesus, our Lord, he's made Jesus now equal with the father. And again, we have a triune God. One being, three distinct separate individual persons, God the Father, God the Son, Jesus, and God the Holy Spirit. And if we're in Christ today, we have relationship with each member of the Trinity. Mm. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Jesus is indeed God, okay? We don't really understand how bad sin is. We don't. I don't. Um, but we know this based on the scriptures, based on the Bible, our sin was so bad, so wicked that, that our God, God, the son, the son of God had to enter humanity. That's how bad sin was to pay the price for sin. God himself in the person of Jesus Christ had to enter humanity, live a perfect, righteous life, die a torturous death and be raised from the dead. That's how bad our sin was really, really is. Wow. Verse three, I thank my God, whom I serve as my forefathers did, with a clear conscience, as night and day, I constantly remember you in my prayers. This is a, this is a powerful statement. He, he starts off with thanksgiving. I thank my God, whom I serve. How much time do you spend in thanksgiving to your heavenly father and to Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit? I was talking to a brother this morning, Gary, after, after pickleball, we were talking about the need to be more thankful. He was telling me how last night he couldn't sleep and how he had, uh, he was just contemplating and, and just, and, and he had a beautiful time of thanksgiving to the Lord. I thank my God whom I serve as my forefathers did. He remembers his forefathers that went before him. Now they served under the, the old Testament. He serves Christ in the new covenant but the Old Testament and New Testament go together. Jesus is the fulfillment of everything, right? The entire Old Testament, the 39 books of the Old Testament are fulfilled in the New Testament in the purpose and the uh, person of Jesus Christ. I thank my God whom I serve, right? And again, are we servants of Jesus? Are we serving Jesus, okay? We, like Paul, ought to be serving him, right? Do you have a lifestyle when you examine yourself of serving your heavenly father, of serving Jesus Christ, our Lord, of serving the Holy Spirit? I thank God whom I serve as my forefathers did with a clear conscience as night and day, I constantly remember you in my prayers. Paul has a, a clear conscience, um, you know, 
it, it doesn't mean that he's perfect, but he has he has no ongoing habitual sin in his life. And with a clear conscience, he's he's praying, he's he's constantly praying, and, and he's constantly praying for Timothy. Okay. Um, again, none of us are perfect, none of us are sinless. But you know, when you look at your life, if you could step back and you should, and we all should examine ourselves, if you can see a pattern right now in anything of deliberate, unrepentant sin, then, then you ought not have a clear conscience. Now, once you repent, once you go before the Lord and say, Lord Jesus, I do confess that I've been sinning and, and whatever it is, right? Um, I've been sinning and, you know, in lying, Lord. Um, I've been sinning and, you know, what, whatever it is that you're struggling with, right? Um, from, you know, um, and again, it's a consistent pattern and you haven't repented. Now, all of us, I, a day rarely goes by that I, I don't repent over something. Generally, I'll repent over just a, an irritation or I'll have been short or curt with someone. Um, again, I'll have been impatient. Um, I'll have been too frustrated or I'll, I'll have complained about too many things. And that's not OK. But this is, you know, these are things I'll repent as they come in. OK. Um, and I'm convicted over it. But I, I, again, you know, if, if you're living in sexual immorality, OK, and, and it's something that you're just giving yourself over to any sin that you've given yourself over to and and you haven't repented, then you ought not have a clear conscience. Your conscience ought to be convicted. You go before the Lord. You do earnestly repent. And then you make an effort to live in a more holy way, to not live in that sinful way. I thank my God, whom I serve as my forefathers did with a clear conscience as night and day, I constantly remember you in my prayers. Here's an example of what a prayer life should look like, okay? We ought to be going to the Lord 10, 15, 20, 30, 40 times a day. It doesn't have to be for 10 minutes. You can go to Jesus for 15 seconds or 20 seconds or 30 seconds. I've said this before. It's wonderful if you pray a 20-minute block. But it would be good if you prayed one 20-minute block and then 20 times for a minute, right? Um, and everything under the conduit of prayer, under the whole, uh, you know, building of prayer, you have thanksgiving, you have praise, um, worshiping the Lord, um, you have intercession, right? Praying for others. But you ought to be going to the Lord and just, just, saying, just saying, thank you, Jesus, right? That's a one second prayer. But throughout your waking hours, if you sleep eight hours a day and you're awake 16 hours, you ought to consistently, you know, throughout your day, be talking to Jesus, having conversations with Jesus, praying for yourself and others, having a lifestyle of thanksgiving. Paul says, as night and day, I constantly remember you in my prayers. Obviously, this man, the Apostle Paul, has a massive belief that prayer does work. The reason that the vast majority of Christians don't pray as they ought is because we don't have faith that it really works. We seem to think whether we pray or not, and, and the leaders, we've talked about this in Kingdom Discipleship, you know, we'll pray for something over and over and over and over and over, sometimes for weeks, months, or years. It'll come to pass, and it's, it, it, you know, we just think the Lord has blessed us, and we forget how much we really have prayed. Um, prayer really, really, really does make a difference. Our Heavenly Father has instituted prayer so that we will go before him daily, not only with our requests for ourselves, but for others um, and with thanksgiving and praise and worship, right? Constantly remember you in my prayers. Verse four, recalling your tears, I long to see you so that I may be filled with joy. Apparently the last time that Paul had, had been with Timothy, um, and was, you know, and they parted. Timothy was was crying out of his tremendous love for his spiritual father, the Apostle Paul. And Paul now chained in a in a Roman dungeon or cave or prison, probably shackles on his hands. Who knows? Maybe he had 10 feet of chain but with his wrist shackled. Right. Recalling your tears, I long to see you. So that I may be filled with joy. Do you do you have. Christian brothers and sisters in your life that when you see them, you're filled with joy or when you talk to them on the phone, 
Do you have Christian brothers or sisters that you know that are walking with Christ and serving Christ and that you have a relationship with, that, you, that you're filled with joy because of their walk with Jesus? Verse 5, I've been reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded now lives in you also. Wow. So Timothy has a godly heritage, okay? As parents, we ought to be laboring to raise our children in Jesus Christ. If we have children, they ought to hear the name of Jesus on our lips every single day. Now, most of us should think and say, golly, I don't, I don't think that's the case. Are you getting down on your knees and praying with your children, say once a day before they go to sleep? Man, again, I've said this over and over and over, but just but just kneeling. I kneel at least twice a day in prayer. And again, my children are grown. They're, you know, they're almost 28 and a half years old, right? Um, but the name of Jesus ought to always be on your mouth. Your children ought to be hearing that, right? For this Verse five, I have been reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded now lives in you also. Paul uses the word sincere faith. Uh, oftentimes, you know, Christians will claim to have faith, but it's not a sincere faith. And, you know, Paul is convinced and persuaded that it lives in Timothy because he has seen Timothy's lifestyle. He's seen Timothy's love for Jesus. Sometimes we can think we have faith, but it's not a sincere faith. If you have a sincere faith, there ought to be an evidence of that faith, the faith of Christ in your life, in, in, in the things you say, in the things you do. There ought to be an evidence in how you're using your time, talents, and money. Do you have a sincere faith in Jesus, or is it just the surface level faith? And I am persuaded now lives in you also. Timothy had a godly heritage of his grandmother and his mother. Mm. His father was a Greek. Uh, we're not told if he came to Christ or not. Man, we ought to be thankful for our godly parents, for our godly grandparents. Mm. Paul goes out of his way to mention that, right? Verse 6, for this reason I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God did not give us a spirit of timidity, but a spirit of power, of love, and of self-discipline. And I'm not going to have time. These are major, major verses here. So I'm not going to have time to, to get into them today. Um, so I'll pick it up next time there. But for this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God that is in you. And we're going to talk more about next time about how the Lord has given us gifts. Every Christian has gifts that have been given to us by our heavenly father, by Jesus Christ, our Lord. The scripture says actually by the Holy Spirit. Um, but it's our job to fan them into flame. Okay. It's our job to stoke them. What happens to a fire that's not stoked? It goes out, right? So our heavenly father has given us, given us all gifts, but it's our job to use those gifts, to stoke those gifts. Um, to make the fire of the gifts we've been given brighter and brighter and brighter and brighter. Okay, it's a cooperation with our Heavenly Father to use our gifts and talents um, in a way that we're more and more serving the kingdom of God and the Son of God and the gospel of God. So we'll talk more about that next time. Father, we do thank you for your word. We thank you for your mercy, your favor, your goodness and your grace on our lives, Father. Father, we do ask you to help us one and all to have a genuine and sincere faith in Jesus Christ, our Lord and Holy Spirit. We ask you to show us if we do not have a sincere faith, if our faith is insincere or disingenuine. Holy Spirit, we ask you to convict us that we would, like our spiritual father, the Apostle Paul, have a, have a, have a greater and more powerful and more intentional prayer life that we might be constantly in prayer, in praise, and thanksgiving, not only for ourselves, but all those in our lives. Holy Spirit, we ask you to seal this message to our hearts now. We want eyes that see Jesus, ears to hear him, hearts to know him better, in Jesus' name and for Jesus' sake. Amen and amen.